Hello and welcome to the 61st session of Course Media Tea Time Talks. We are part of the Inter for Young Academy, an ambitious initiative by and for early career course media researchers around the world. And we are under the umbrella of International Society of Course Media or Interpol. With this webinar series, we aim to give junior researchers, primarily PhD candidates and postdocs, working in diverse course media sciences, the opportunity to present their work to the scientific community worldwide. Our vision is to level the playing field for, for the next generation of exceptional researchers by providing them a, a room for equal opportunity exposure, encouraging interdisciplinary collaboration, and enhancing career development prospects. My name is Mohamed Nuraiku. I am a researcher at the CO2 and Hydrogen Storage Group at the University of Oslo, and I'm thanking you for joining us today. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Tobias Forslund is a postdoctoral researcher at the Lulu University of Technology. He is an expert in using, implementing, and developing GPU accelerated methods for investigating transitional flow in cross media. Tob Tobias' main focus has been um, accurately modeling both temporal and spatial scales of fluid motion in ordered cross media. During his postdoctoral research, he has continued applying these methods to study similar phenomena in more general packed beds. Thank you, Tobias, for joining us today. We are excite excited to hear about your uh, very interesting research, and the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the introduction. So, uh, the name of my talk is GPU Accelerated Methods for Transition of Flows in Porous Media. And as mentioned, I have a PhD from Lully University of Technology at Fluid and Experimental Mechanics, and I'm currently doing my postdoctor here. Uh, so, before we get into any of the details, uh, I would just like to shortly present uh, our department or my subject here uh, at LTU. So, we're located just below the polar circle here uh, in northern Sweden, and uh, we have 18 senior staff and 23 PhD students. So, we do a lot of industrial and environmental flows. Uh, and especially uh, coupled closely to the, the industries that are here locally in northern Sweden. Uh, so we have a modern laboratory, uh, the John Field Laboratory, and we have good resources for computations. So yearly we publish about 30 papers in peer review journals and uh, 15 papers on conferences. So it's uh, like a, a medium-sized uh, department where we do a lot of stuff that is closely connected to industry. That's sort of our profile. So let's get into it. So transitional flow in porous media and uh, how we define it. So I'm going to show an animation here uh, where you can see sort of uh, how the different regions uh, of flow in porous media looks like. Uh, so furthest to the left here, you can see a Darcyan flow. So I don't mention specific Reynolds numbers here because the Reynolds numbers aren't really uh, important. You can define them however you want. The important thing is that it would increase to the right. So for the Darcyan flow, the viscosity completely dominates the flow. Uh, and as you get into the laminar steady region, you have some inertial effects, but the flow is still entirely steady. So you would say that the temporal change at the velocity is zero. Uh, in the laminar unsteady region, you can see that you are getting some variations uh, in the flow field but the variations are fairly large in the flow field so usually you would see one single peak in the frequency spectrum or the temporal fluctuations for this uh, laminar unsteady case and then in the turbulent case the transition between the laminar unsteady and the turbulent case is not entirely uh, clearly defined it depends on who you ask but uh, usually you would say that you have temporal variation with the turbulent cascade so essentially, when this, these uh, turbulent spatial scales get small enough so that they are significantly smaller than the pore size, then you would say, yeah, now it's turbulent. But, but before that, when it's dominated by a single large frequency, you would say it's, it's laminar unsteady. So that's how we define a uh, transition of flow uh, in porous media. So let's talk a bit about our approach to modeling this uh, transition of flow. So with experimental and numerical methods. 
So this talk is mainly about the numerical methods, but uh, I feel like I need to bring it up, uh, the experimental methods as well, because a numerical method is not really useful unless you can actually validate it against something. So the tools that we have at our disposal is uh, tomographic PIV measurements, and uh, the rig sort of looks like this. So what you do is that you inject a bunch of particles into some fluid, and then you uh, see how the particles move, take sequential images with these cameras, and you can reconstruct a 3D flow field uh, from that. And then to be able to capture it accurately, you need to uh, refractively index match the obstructions with the, the liquid. So we have used some mineral oil and heptane mixture to, max, or to match it to uh, uh, quartz glass uh, for this case. Uh, you can see sort of uh, a CAD overview of what the rig uh, looks like there. So similar methods uh, is laser Doppler velocimetry, where instead of gathering a lot of data to form averages over a large domain, we look at a single point, and then we get a lot of temporal information instead from which we can extract turbulence characteristics and so on uh, within that specific point. So uh, you can say that these two methods sort of complete each other in the sense that the tomographic PIV gives us a lot of average over a large spatial extent, and the laser Doppler velocity gives us a lot of temporal information in a single point, but no spatial uh, distribution. Though. So, and this can also be completed then with a pressure monitoring uh, procedure, which we have used in uh, this article here. It, yeah, you can read if you're interested in finding out more about how these experimental procedures are set up uh, and done. So it's called non stokesian flow through ordered thin porous media image by tomographic uh, PID. So that's the experimental methods uh, that we used. So when it comes to numerical modeling, we have uh, two main, main approaches that we use uh, for simulating uh, transitional flow in porous media. So one is an artificial compressibility finite difference method. So for this method, you start immediately from the Navier-Stokes equations, but you adapt the continuity condition a little bit. So what you can see here is that instead of just using a continuity condition, we have added a compressibility factor beta here. And then we have added a, a temporal change to the pressure term. So this is sort of inspired from how a gas would function. Uh, so as you have a positive influx into a region or an odor of volume, you would increase the pressure uh, in that region. And these are called artificial compressibility finite uh, or artificial compressibility methods. And the version that uh, I have implemented and that is available, I will show a link later as an open source project, uses uh, central differences uh, in an FDM environment. So this results in a computation, a spatial computation of kernel that looks a bit like this. And then you can also just uh, discretize the temporal derivative using uh, an Euler forward uh, for the case of a GPU where you can uh, use a lot of additional time steps without getting, uh, yeah, some still be computationally efficient. So the one of the methods that I've been using for most of the time is uh, so-called Lattice-Boltzmann methods. So these methods start from the Boltzmann equation uh, instead. And this looks a bit like this. Uh, and you can see that it, it looks a bit like a, like a convection uh, diffusion equation, uh, depending on how you define this omega uh, function to the right. Uh, and it recreates the hydrodynamic behavior as an emergent effect. So the hydrodynamic behavior is a second order effect. So usually you subdivide the, uh, the computations into two steps, uh, a relaxation step and the streaming step. So during the relaxation step, you take all the velocity distributions that you have within your current node and you sort of contract them to, or you apply some sort of uh, operation onto them. And then during the streaming step, you exchange the information in between them. And it turns out that this procedure is really appropriate for uh, GPU implementation, which is why it has garnered uh, such a wide application within that community. Uh, so here you can see examples of what these distribution functions would look like in 3D for two examples. So 
Uh, this one to the right here is a so-called D3Q27. So it has three dimensions and 27 uh, distributions. And here is a D3Q7, which has seven different values and uh, three dimensions. So just some short info about uh, GPU programming as well. So uh, to the left here, you can see a bit of an overview of what a CPU would look like. So we would have the core and the control unit and the L1 cache. Uh, in comparison, the GPU has a lot of cores for each control volume. So th that means that if we can manage to make an algorithm that makes use of uh, doing very similar operations, then we can really use uh, the GPU efficiently. And uh, what you can see is that from, for this LVM model, it's very easy to parallelize into that uh, situation because what we're doing at each node is essentially exactly the same. So it's one of these uh, embarrassing, embarrassingly parallelizable problems that is really straightforward to do. Uh, and you don't really need a high-end GPU to do it uh, at all. Uh, even though not all algorithms are suitable for GPU implementations. So those with large computational kernels or branching program structures uh, are commonly given examples of this. So voxel servers such as those uh, presented here are especially well suited since the memory can be packed efficiently and the program structure is identical for each node. Uh, and an additional perk that you get from the GPU programming is that uh, live rendering for the visualization can be done uh, immediately since the data is already stored on the GPU. Uh, so this is sort of what I just said, that we can do the analysis and the rendering directly uh, on the GPU, which we can do quickly because the GPU is a computationally uh, efficient uh, machine. So extracting the renal stresses or other higher order moments from the simulations can be done uh, directly on the GPU and then just save down. So this is something that uh, I've made use uh, of uh, a lot uh, in my work. And this also yields quick simulation feedback. And here you can see an example of what it looks like, sort of the interface while I'm running my simulations. So uh, I have this live renderer that uh, renders the simulation results. And usually if I'm confronted with some new type of problem, I would boot this up, load in my geometry, and I would mess around with the, the viscosity and the uh, driving forces and so on and try to see what happens within this specific geometry uh, that I'm looking at. In this sense, it's very similar to like an open source version of ANSYS. Uh, ANSYS has a similar tool. I can't remember what it's called uh, right now. Yeah. Uh, so here you can see an example of an implementation uh, of a dual lattice hydrodynamic thermal uh, LBM model and how it looks like when you're running it for a porous media. So this is a more highly resolved simulation uh, with a thermal component. So what we're looking at here is the thermal field. And uh, you can see that we are getting a uh, really high resolution. We can see all the vortices within the flow and so on uh, quite clearly. And if you look up this article, you can also see that it accurately recreates uh, uh, the expected behavior. Uh, for this type of system. So we can go all the way from like Darcy and flow up until non-steady. Some people would call this non-turbulent, some people would call this turbulent, but it depends sort of on who you ask, whether the, the scales are actually small enough to classify it as that. So let's get into some, uh, some interesting results then. Uh, how much time do I have, by the way? You can continue to waste, no problem. Okay, yeah, nice. So uh, some of it published and some of it uh, unpublished. So first I wanna talk about steady state inertia structures. So an interesting steady state inertia flow structure was discovered while we were doing this uh, tomographic PIV experiments that I mentioned earlier. So as the Reynolds number is increased, you can see that we go from having 
the viscous diffusion sort of just destroying all the structures in the material up to a situation where the turbulence is just destroying all the structures in the material and in between we have a lot of interesting stuff going on especially you can see this uh, epsilon shaped uh, uh, profiles that appear around the Reynolds number of 170 and then slowly disappear uh, as the Reynolds number is increased. Uh, from numerical simulations we figure out that the effect is not a wall effect but actually a steady state inertial uh, flow transition. And uh, this is the sort of the model uh, material used so you can see a staggered cell with periodic conditions on all sides. And at a specific Reynolds number, the flow goes from being uh, symmetrical, nice, sort of as you would expect 2D for this case, into this uh, sort of uh, zigzag pattern or that is significantly more uh, topologically complex. Uh, so the question that arises from this is, of course, is this transition specific to the staggered cylinder packing or is it a specific example of a more general transition? What types of packing does this transition occur in or is there any volume average flow field quantity that characterizes this transition. So three different ordered packings are investigated for this. So uh, a staggered cylinder packing, uh, a staggered rod packing, and uh, a staggered uh, or a BCC packing of spheres. Uh, so they are all sort of high tortuosity packings that you would expect to yeah, there are sort of model problems that you see popping up uh, every here now and then. So for the staggered cylinder case, you can see that as the Reynolds number is increased, you have this cutoff point where this uh, onset starts or the transition onset starts. And we see that we don't have a really significant change in dimensionless pressure drop. So you probably wouldn't see this if you had like a pressure meter uh, in your flow. So this is just something that the flow would do and you wouldn't notice, although other properties of your porous material or porous flow might of course change, such as uh, dispersion. Uh, for the staggered rod, we actually see that we have a trend change uh, at the, the break or in the transition onset. So you probably would notice this if you had only a pressure monitor. And uh, for the BCC packing, we see that we actually get two separate transitions. Uh, but this later one is really the one that, that we are interested in. And here we can also see a similar trend break uh, to the staggered rod case. So it turned out that a reliable indicator for this change uh, was actually the surface integral of the pressure across the solid fluid interface. So it turns out that these inertial cores really, uh, as the viscosity is decreased, they tend to not impinge on the solid surfaces. So they tend to search, find alternative flow paths around those. And this uh, strictly changes uh, the value of this integral directly uh, at, as the transition occurs. So it can be interpreted as the inertial cores no longer impinging on the solid structures, sort of the takeaway from this. And, uh, uh, later uh, analysis also shows that the helicity, which is a measure of the topological complexity of the flow, is also strongly related to this. But this is not something that would really be observable uh, from you. Uh, if you wanted to look at a bed, you could conceivably see how hard uh, the flow is pushing at your solid structures, but you couldn't really see the, the helicity of the flow. So, But still, the helicity turned out to be a better measure of, of this uh, transition. So this is also actually published uh, research. So you can look it up if you want to know the details of it in this article, Steady State Transitions in Order for its Media. Uh, so another research direction is the interaction between large scale flow structures in 2D and 3D porous media. So when we say large scale flow structures, we say flow structures that are significantly larger than a single representative elementary volume. So if we would have some repeating structure throughout our domain and we see flow structures appearing that are larger than that repeating structure would have uh, large scale flow structures. And this is of course related to how large our representative elementary volume needs to be in order for its media. Uh, so these are some examples of how you can sort of uh, 
place out this or, or tile this uh, across 2D space. Uh, uh, and uh, in conclusion, we have uh, said that, uh, or we have come to the conclusion that the representative elementary volume has a large impact on the emergent microscopic properties. Especially these one by one cells turns out to be really bad uh, when it comes to predicting behavior in the unsteady domain. And this is also uh, explained in great detail and analyzed in the effects of periodicity assumptions in porous media modeling. It's another article that I urge you to, to look into if you're interested more in this. So instead of diving into sort of graphs and everything, I'm just going to show you uh, some videos where you can pretty clearly see uh, what these uh, large scale structures actually look like. So this is an example of where we have an inline arrangement of cylinders with walls on top and bottom. And what you can see is that all conditions are the same across all of these uh, simulations. The difference uh, is uh, only the amount of times this uh, representative elementary volume is tiled. So how much repetitions you have of it. And what you can see is that uh, here at uh, around time step 130,000, you can see that uh, you have a trend break for the 4x4 and the 3x3 repetition. Uh, and this significantly lowers the interstitial velocity. And because of that, it also lowers the, the pressure drop, or the pressure drop becomes higher, dimensionless pressure drop. So this actually increases the resistance. And uh, even though the effect is later to start for the 2x2 case, it doesn't start at all for the one by one case because it, there's no way for a one by one uh, repetition to actually represent this. And this is sort of uh, uh, the idea behind this. And formally uh, in the, uh, the paper, I analyzed this using a proper orthogonal decomposition. And then you can sort of extract what these different uh, large scale structures actually look like. But intuitively, you can understand it by just looking at these animations and seeing, yeah, well, am I actually capturing? Uh, all of the, the flow structures. Uh, these uh, things also occur in uh, uh, staggered porous media as well. And uh, you can see here for a 4x4 repetition or a 2x2 two two repetition that the interstitial velocity is significantly higher for the two by two case compared to the four by four. But here it's not really as obvious what the large scale structures are. So you can't really see them directly by, by looking at it uh, with your eyes like this. Uh, so, so here you would need to do like uh, some further analysis uh, on it to actually see uh, what is the difference between them. So uh, I've seen some cases where people would be happy with just using like a representative elementary volume uh, like this. But usually if you're doing uh, temporal simulations, you should really investigate how large it needs to be. So uh, the LBM method uh, can also be used to resolve the flow during transition in uh, large porous systems. So here you can see a... Uh, from this, uh, uh, so we have modeled this experimental cell that we have used uh, in ex experiments earlier. Uh, and uh, the geometry looks like this. And uh, the different meshes that you can use sort of uh, look like this. So the wall elements are marked in yellow or the neighbor wall elements is marked in yellow and the purple ones are uh, wall elements. And uh, you can see that the LBM method is uh, capable of accurately uh, capturing the behavior throughout the computational cell. Uh, so you can see that you have different behaviors close to the wall compared to uh, far from the wall. And uh, com compare it with experiment, you can see that we're getting similar behavior, although not exact. And I mean, measurement errors and slight uh, inlet deviations are, of course, to be expected. Uh, so there is nothing strange about this. 
So both for the laser Doppler velocimetry and for the LVM simulations, we are getting a fairly good agreement. So in summary then, with the GPU accelerated methods, large data sets uh, from sweeps can be generated. These data sets can then be analyzed either on device or saved for later analysis. Uh, the computational capacity of the GPU naturally invites studies of systems that take a long time to evolve or statistical quantities that take a long time to gather. So the work has resulted in two open source solvers that are published under an MIT license and you can find them uh, at these addresses. They are also referenced to uh, in my work, so uh, you can use them. Uh, uh, they are free to use. And then thank you for your attention and I'll gladly take any questions. And also this research was funded by Wetenskapsrådet. Excellent. Thank you very much Tobias for, for the excellent overview of your uh, wonderful research. Uh, you dived into many different things and the, the, the tools that you are using is certainly of interest for many young researchers. To keep it educational, do you have any suggestions or any a recommendation from where to start if anybody is interested in GPU accelerated methods, uh, how, how they should uh, uh, approach this, this kind of techniques and how they can uh, make progress rather quickly with implementing the, 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 the directions that they want uh, with the GPU assisted methods. Yes, uh, I, I like the idea that people should uh you know, or try to build things themselves from the, the ground up so that they properly understand it uh, well. And uh, I would say that start with reading the articles uh, on LBM that are like um, sort of the groundwork that was done on it. And implementing a model such as, uh, uh, what was it called now? Then one of these single, simple relax, uh, single relaxation time models are really straightforward and easy and transferring it to a GPU is, not especially hard. There are some some steps there in between, uh, and I would say uh, just read the articles and start messing around with GPU computing. And there are really good guides uh, for CUDA and OpenCL uh, to get started with this. And uh, just don't be afraid uh, to get into it. It is it is hard, but it is easier than you think. I would say. And uh, do you have any any suggestions for the sources for the tutorials that our our audience can can go and check? Uh, yeah, I would need to to look through my uh, uh, bibliography uh, for that. But I would say, actually, Nicolas Del Bosque, I think, is called. Is um, he did his PhD is uh, some time ago and I find myself constantly referencing that and there he really goes into detail into the CUDA programming and uh, why LBM is uh, good and, and so on. I don't know if I can write it down somewhere here or just but, uh, I, I would say that his thesis is a good resource uh, for this. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you again for joining us and for this uh, very excellent overview of your wonderful research. And now let's gears and move on to the second speaker of today. Uh, Sajjad Furughi is a research associate at the Imperial College London in the Air Science Department. Uh, his expertise lies in the poor scale modeling, image analysis, and the application of computational methods for multi-phase flow in process media. Sajjad holds a PhD from Sharif University of Technology in Iran. We, we appreciate you being with us today, Sajjad. We are looking forward to your presentation and please go ahead and start. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mohammed. Hi, everyone. Uh, the presentation that I would like to present today is on the work on the multi-scale formative modeling we did in Imperial College. So if I want to, uh, the outline of the work, it would be like we, at the start, I, I present the the workflow that we are either allowed for incorporation of the microprocessor or superposition processor into per scale modeling. So 
at the first I, I started with the, this, uh, this explaining this workflow and then I shared the result for two cases study. One of them is water with the stellatus sample and the next one is a solarian dolomite sample and then the conclusion and future direction for this research. So uh, we know what is pro scale mo modeling or pro scale imaging uh, make it possible for us to see inside the pores and the tiny pores and ma made, it, made it possible for us to do simulation on the smaller scale of the porous material. And in this uh, research, I work on the rocks, for example. So when we do the per scale imaging, we have always a trade off between the voxel size and field of view. If we, we want to see a high, uh, high you want to fully resolve the porous space, we need to have a small voxel size, then the field of view will, will be small. And if we want to have a larger field of view, we have a bigger voxels and we lost a lot of features and we cannot fully resolve the pore space. So there is always a trade off between these two. And then with the micro CT laboratory stuff that we have, we can get the resolution between three to five micron, not not lower than this resolution, so it make it possible if the porous material is uh, wide and we have a lower pore space than this uh, size, we cannot resolve it. So there is uh, always a sub-resolution porosity, and for some cases like Stellatus rock, which is a heterogeneous rock with wide pore size distribution, we have a huge fraction of pore spaces unresolved. For example, in, in a study by Lina Taub, they could just resolve by, by 3.58 voxel, they could resolve 11% of a sample which has a 29% porosity. So how we can uh, characterize this sub-resolution porosity? Or, so uh, for the characterization and for quantification of this uh, unresolved porosity, we use a technique called differential imaging. We have a dry scan image fully saturated with dry air and we have a one uh, against fully saturated with prime by difference between these two images we can quantify the sub-resolution porosity and why the this uh, sub-resolution process is important in modeling is not just because of the uh, volume its effect on the connectivity accessibility and if we don't consider them in the modeling uh, the model will have a we cannot see the actual image and actual uh, poor space connectivity. So the goal of this study is to integrate, to incorporate this sub-resolution process in our modeling. So this is the general workflow of the work. So the at the one you will, uh, I show here the one slice of the dry scan. So by dry scan, we can do segmentation and we can see the poor space. At the same time, if we have a same rock full, fully saturated with 30% Ki, Brian, we can see uh, the sub-resolution by differential imaging, and we, we can segment the voxels that contain sub-resolution porosity. And then from the result for space, we can, like traditionally what we did, we do point to extraction, and we extract it as a network of pores and throats. But with the new work, the workflow that I am presenting here, we include this sub-resolution porosity as a new type of element that we call it microlinks. So the, the development of this workflow, we need to, as I said, we, I need to, we need to include this sub-resolution porosity as a microlink into the, our pornotope modeling. For this, we developed uh, an automatic deletion algorithm that find each voxel with sub-resolution porosity uh, that uh, the two nearest port to this sub-resolution voxel. So all of this uh, process is uh, done by automatic deletion algorithm. It's like a burning algorithm. And we've, uh, we assign two ports to each microprose, which is the nearest port. All of the microprose voxel with the same, uh, with the same pair of the ports belong to the one microlink that they connect these two ports to each other. So then 
uh, it's the process of the microlink is presented here. So, for example, how is uh, deletion algorithm work? And this is two ports. This is a micro port region between them. And we if we have assigned uh, nearest port and then the next nearest port, and then by combining them, we can find a microlink between two ports. And this, uh, this schematic for the case that we have a micro port region between three ports, and we find three microlinks between these three ports. So based after the characterization of the micro microlinks in terms of topology, we can include it in the, our network. Here is the network, uh, as I said, from the result port, and here is the multi-scale network. Uh, then, after the characterization of microlink topologically, we need to assign to them the length, area, volume, uh, because this microlink is a Darcy type element. It's not uh, like a result port and throat that they have actual length, throat, area. So, we calculated from the differential imaging result. Differential imaging provides us the porosity map. So, the, from porosity, we can get volume, and the, from volume and the distance, we can get length and we assign area to this micro and also proxy to these micro links. And then we assign the single phase property for the single phase property. I mean, uh, conductance, permeability, we use the cosine Kalman equation. And for the two phase property that for the micro link we require, we use the uh, empirical model uh, to assign to them uh, saturation and uh, conductivity and capillary pressure. After this, we need to modify our flow model to include these new microlinks, and then we validate our result against the, uh, against the experimental result that we have. So the challenge that we have is the computational, uh, the, uh, the computational challenge that we have, one of the challenges. The, the problem that we work with a big image. So in this big image, we need to uh, do the deletion algorithm uh, for, to find the nearest port and next nearest port. And this, because this image is three dimensional, uh, 1000 by 1000 by 1000, it's, it's really big image. We need to do in the parallel. So we decompose our pore space to sub volume and then do the deletion algorithm on the sub volume. And also, another challenge is physical challenge that we have is that when we have uh, two microlinks, uh, connected by a pore, it, we should be able to have a bypassing of the pore because in some scenario, the pore, for example, here, pore J, can be filled first. And when this first uh, completely filled, it can hinder, it can stop the flows uh, through the microlinks. To stop this, uh, to, to, to bypass, to have a, to let the flow bypass this pore, we use this condition for the conductance of the, the between two ports. As I said, for the microlink, we need to assign the proper physical property like volume, area, porosity, and permeability, which I, I show the relation here that we use. This is, this is the main source of this uh, parameter is determined from the porosity map, which determined from the differential imaging. And also for two-phase property, we use leverage a function as a, a two dimension dimension of the capillary pressure and then uh, for the j function that we have we for the drainage we use the power law model and for the water flooding part we developed a, we propose a tangent function model that can capture the capillary model that we expect in the water in the water flooding then it can handle different type of wettability and for the Conductance of the microlinks, we use the Paola model, and for the resistivity, we use Archie model. So here I show the the result, that result uh, the shape of the capillary pressure and relative permeability model. Here the drainage from the Paola model and the capillary model came from the proposed model that we uh, the reference for this I, at the end of the presentation I sh I will show. Here is the capillary model for different in start of the saturation in the microlinks uh, based on the tangent function model. And uh, this is the result of the relative permeability, but uh, we uh, consider the kilo model to see the hysteresis. So, 
So the the then when we up, when developed our workflow, we apply it to the one of the case study, which is water with a stellar sample. This is a lot of sample done by uh, uh, Yang Ga. Uh, she did two samples, one of them water with uh, two water with sample, one of them with a higher capillary, which has intermittency effect, and one with a lower capillary. Uh, I use uh, the lower capillary without the intermittency effect, and it's, it's because it's a water wet, it's a perfect case to check uh, the value uh, to our work, uh, to check it out on for our work. So. Uh, if I can show the yeah, here is the result of the porcelain distribution for the stellatus and for uh, two other samples. So as I said, for the stellatus, we have a white porcelain distribution. So for example, here is three. Uh, if you consider three point five eight here as a result, huge fraction of the pore space is unresolved. Uh, the the stellatus did blow here. So for this case, uh, for the this case, stellatus case, the helium process is thirty percent. The result process is just ten percent, and huge fraction of the process is unresolved. So and this is the process from differential imaging. So you can see the differential imaging can get similar result to helium process, which show that uh, the potential of the differential imaging. So. We select uh, three sub volume from this uh, sample this, uh, with the size of 1,127 by 1,000 cube of this uh, sample, three sub volume. And we run the poor network modeling without considering the sub resolution process and with the multi scale poor network. Here is the sub volume one. For example, you can see that the process, this is the result process. And after including the sub-resolution from differential imaging, this is the proxy from the multi-scale poor network. And also, this is the permutative from the multi-scale poor network. And this is the result of permutative without, uh, without uh, considering the microlinks. You can see that the permeability is one order of magnitude lower than the experimental value. So if one can, if we want to be able to match the permeability from experiment, we need to include the uh, include the microprocessor or sub-resolution processor. Same for formation factor. Here the formation factor is huge, which means it's wrong, it's not connected, the connectivity is poor. And we know the actual formation factor should be much lower. And this is the result from the multi-scale, which is much closer to the what we expect for a, a slider flop. Same thing for the other sub-volume. So, uh, for the next stage, well, for the single phase, we did we showed that the multi-scale present uh, very well when we uh, uh, when we were applied for the slides. The next is to see their behavior for the two-phase flow simulation. In the case of two-phase flow simulation, we we noticed that we need to consider two type of microlink because if we consider, if you can see here this 3.58 resolution, we can see that. Not all of the sub unresolved pore space is microprocessing. Actually, it is two types of microprocessing we need to consider. One of these unresolved microprocessing, and one of them is microprocessing. So we consider two types of microlinks, and depend on the prosty of microlinks, we assign different grain diameter, which affect the permeability of microlink from the cosine Carmen equation. But to be able to match the capillary here, we the define a smooth transition. It means we don't we don't use a specific criteria to define those microlinks. We use a normal distribution to find the critical value to uh, to uh, classify these microlinks. So here is the result of the MICP capillary pressure from the differential data for Estelados, and here is the result also the result of the capillary pressure from the uh, model multi-scale model MICP. So you can see that the model can be able to match the MICP result very well for all of the three, three sub volume. And uh, this shows the potential to, to, for two phase flow of the model. Here is the result of the, the prediction of the result of the relative permeability for three sub volume. 
uh, we don't have the result uh, for experimental result for this uh, subvolume, but uh, their behavior from is uh, is in line with what we see in the literature. So, and then the result of water flooding for the Stellades is the result of uh, first sub volume, this is second sub volume, and this is third sub volume for permeable, relative permeability. Relative permeability is an important parameter for us, and we can see that uh, all of the experimental results match very, uh, our modeling results match very well with the experimental result that we have. So, so we could be able to validate our workflow and our multi scale formula to, for this uh, Stellados uh, sample. The next sample that we want to apply is is a Silurian dolomite sample. For this sample, we don't have any experimental result regarding two-phase flow. So we just predict what would be the result if, uh, uh, based on our multi-scale formative model. This is the other sample is similar to the previous one. The remability is like 350 millidarcy uh, uh, based on different uh, sub-volumes that we have. And uh, this is from uh, provided by shell for us and this is pore size distribution we can see here as well we have two type of uh, two peaks which show it's a microporous rock and uh, because of the uh, we consider voxel size here for example we can see we need to consider two type of uh, micro links for this case sample as well micp also provided so uh, so we took this image uh, 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 the, this is micro core, and uh, this is a miniature core with 20 millimeter length and 6 millimeter uh, diameter. Uh, and uh, we did uh, one dry scan, one fully saturated brine 30 percent KI, and we could be able to do differential imaging and extract the porosity map at the same time. Permeability from uh, experiment that we did is like 200 millidarcy. So here is the result of permeability from the, provided by uh, Shell for us, the laboratory in Shell, and this is from the sub volume of that sample, which is a smaller part of the sample. It's more or less same, same in the same range as the bigger sample. So we uh, select uh, five sub volume from this uh, sample, which uh, with the size of 1,000 cube, the voxel size for here 3.95, and uh, the porosity, helium porosity, 23%. So here is the result of the subvolume. This is the result of differential imaging porosity. And uh, the differential imaging porosity is more or less the same as the, what we see in the helium porosity measurement. This is the result of pore size distribution for Result for, and also this is a result of permeability by, by multi scale formative model. We can see that uh, here the result process is like uh, half, half of the pore space is result, is not as like, like the Stellades, we can resolve more pore space, but still, result of permeability is lower than what we can get from the multi scale and also lower than the experimental result. Same as formation factor, without uh, considering microsafe formation factor is much larger than the uh, formation factor when we consider multi-scale, which which make more, which is more uh, in line with what we see in the literature for formation factor of this type of rock. And this is the this is the result of the MICP for this uh, sub volume and this, uh, also result of uh, capillary pressure for this sub volume. So in here, same as the previous case, we defined two type of micro links with the sub criteria to, as a, uh, to have a smooth transition between these two regions. So we could be able to get the same behavior as MICP. The, this MICP is exactly the same rock, but uh, this MICP of other sample rock is, uh, is more or less similar. But uh, we can see that the, the model can catch this uh, smooth transition between different behavior that we have for the MIC, uh, for the capillary pressure. So 
Here is the result of the relative permanency. This is the predicted result for this uh, five sub volume. And uh, as I said, uh, it, we don't have the, uh, the result of the experimental result, so it's just prediction. And the last case is that what will happen if we change the saturation in the start of water flooding for this sub volume? Uh, we change so we change the start of water flooding from 25% to 45% uh, and we can see the relative permanency for different uh, saturation initial saturation so we our in our workflow we'll be able to uh, develop this multi scale polynomial modeling we tested against the uh, Stellar slug with experimental result, we could be able to match the result of the relative permeability by calibration against the permeability formation factor and capillary pressure. And uh, we applied for the different rock, cellular dolomite. We could be able to match uh, the capillary pressure, uh, capillary pressure, and we predict the result of relative permeability. And uh, currently. What we are want to do, we want to see the effect of what uh, with ability on the on the relative permeability by this uh, by this multi-scale polynomial model tools that we have, and then we want to apply it for other samples that we have uh, in the our, in our project. So at the end, I would like to sh uh, thank Shell for the support of this work, and here is the. Uh, thank you for your attention. Here's the reference and also our GitHub for the code and uh, for the paper. Excellent. Thank you very much, Sajjad. It was really exciting work and well done. Uh, just to, to clarify, these references one and two are the uh, published work based on the presentation you gave today. Yes? Yes. Yeah, excellent. Very well. Uh, we have a question from Saeed Sadiq uh, He's asking, uh, uh, Sajja, thank you so much for your nice work and the presentation. How do you determine the microlinks uh, diameter when an unresolved process is shared among various uh, poles? Uh, yeah, my, uh, thank you, Saeed. That's a great question. For the microlink, as I said, we have a cons we defined as a Darcy type element. So for the Darcy type element, we don't have a, a parameter for diameter of the microlink. We 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 use the Cosine Kalman to determine the permeability, and uh, uh, we use the porosity from porosity map uh, uh, derived from the differential imaging to determine the porosity of microlinks. And then from the porosity, we can determine the permeability of the microlinks. And then the permeability used for the, in our point of model. Um, excellent. Jumping on uh, Said's question, in, in some of the reactive transport model studies that we perform, sometimes we have evolving porous media, either because of the dissolution and precipitation. And in many of them, we are always dealing with unresolved processes. And Based on the measurements and also based on the simulations, we know that the cosine Corman will not work for such a system. Uh, do you have Do you have any suggestion how we can use uh, multi-scale PNN and the approach that you are developing uh, fitted for the reactive transport modeling in the evolving geometries? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. For the evolving geometry, if we can see the pore space, so then the we don't need the relation for the micro like if we can see the pore space we can resolve it then we can extract it and we can have diameter and parameter for the element but if we don't have we need to define a consider empirical model for the micro link to relate the microprocity to the conductivity so it could be the cause and karma but you can change it whatever which relation that give you uh, at the at the upper scale at the uh, at the upper scale result match the, the the capillary pressure and the capillary and the also formation factor and permeability uh, you can you can change and tune it based on the parameter that you have in our microlink so it can be causing it can be any other model excellent yeah thank you very much Sajjad.
Thank you again, uh, Sajjad and Tomayes, for joining us today. Now let's wrap up this session, and I would like to introduce our uh, speakers for the next session. Uh, we have Arone De Luca from Milano, from, from Milan Polytechnic University in Italy. He's going to talk about mixing porous media, recon reconnecting with spreading. And also we will have Mahsa Shirazi from the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering in the Sharif University of Technology in Tehran, Iran. Uh, they will give a, their talks on October 15th at uh, 330 uh, Central European time. And we would like to invite all of you to join uh, those talks. This is the Porous Media Tea Time Talks team. Uh, and uh, we are organizing this, this webinar series uh, every month. If you would like to be part of the, uh, our webinar and if you feel that you are having a wonderful research that should be shared with, the, uh, with, the, with your peers around, around the globe, uh, drop, drop us an email and we will contact you and we will try to organize a session for you. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Sajjad and Tobias, and thank you everyone for being with us. Uh, have a nice evening and ciao.